This is a Floating Voter Budget Special in association with EY Ireland. Hello, I'm Kevin Doyle and this is the Floating Voter Budget Special in association with EY. It's been a week when the country veered towards level 5 COVID restrictions before the government slammed on the brakes. Brexit talks continue to crawl forward but the likelihood of a trade deal is still very much in the balance. And all the while, in the background, Pascal Donoghue and Michael McGrath have been meeting ministers to hammer out what will be the first budget of the Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, Green Coalition. I'm joined, as always, by INM's political editor, Philip Ryan, and with us to discuss exactly what is going to be, or what should be, in that very unique budget is Sinn Féin's housing spokesperson, Owen O'Brien. Owen, you're very welcome to The Floating Voter. Thanks for having me. Sinn Féin have released their... Uh, budget submission, you'd call it. Maybe their alternative budget is probably the best way of describing it um, today. And I, I've gone through it, right? And here is some of the highlights. And uh, there are only highlights really in it as you go through it, Owen, it has to be said. Uh, 4,000 affordable homes, 1,100 new hospital beds, 100 ICU beds, a living wage, 800 Gardaí, a suckler calf scheme that will give you €300 Euro for the first calf. A 500 euro off college fees, the SUSE grant to go up by 10%, 70 million for, to subsidise childcare, uh, retirement at 65 fund worth 127 million a year, two and a half thousand new doctors, nurses, consultants, and other hospital staff, property tax down 20%. I could keep going on, um, but it would probably take up the whole podcast. And so the opening question is how much is the Sinn Fein budget for 2021? Yeah, so at the, at the very start of the document, we outline, I suppose, the, the additional levels of expenditure that we would make over the broad parameters of what we know from, from the government's own package. So whereas the government's package is somewhere in the region of about, about uh, uh, 12 billion, we're looking at about an extra six on top of that. So it brings it about uh, uh, 18 billion in total. Uh, what I would say is... is, is So how much is that? Just, just to be clear, like the, the, the budget... Now, obviously, last year's budget got blown up by COVID, but it was in around 70 billion total was the expenditure side. So how much are you proposing to, uh, you would spend next year? Well, on top of that, an extra 18. Mm. Um, so 88 billion. Absolutely. And, and the three things you have to say. First of all, budgets are about choices. Um, and, and all budgets are about what additional revenue you raise, additional borrowing, and additional investment. But the second thing is, is this is an exceptionally unusual year in the sense that uh, there are a, a, a series of, of expenditure requirements that are temporary for the duration of COVID. We don't know how long that's going to be, if it's six months, a year or two years. Uh, but there's also an opportunity here uh, to borrow, to invest in critical, critical public infrastructure uh, at uh, not only historically low rates, but as you saw yesterday, at the NTMA borrowing at negative interest rates. So there's pretty much unanimity from the ESRI, from the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council, from IBEC, from ICTU, that now is the time to sensibly borrow, not just to cover the short-term COVID-19 income supports and business supports, but to invest in critical infrastructure to tackle many of the problems that pre-existed COVID are today making people's lives more difficult because of the high cost of rent or mortgages or childcare, et cetera, and to come out the other side of, of this uh, a health emergency in a better shape than we went into it. I mean, simple things, for example, like ICU capacity, we know from the, the discussions between government and NEFID over the last two weeks, one of the reasons why NEFID are so concerned about the spread of the, 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 the virus is we have one of the lowest levels of ICU beds uh, per thousand population anywhere in the Eurozone. Additional capacity there is not just needed because of COVID-19, it's needed anyway. So we have a small window of opportunity to give people greater security and certainty in these very troubling times, particularly if there's increased restrictions in the coming weeks or months but also to ensure that we don't go back to the way things were before because on health, on housing, on childcare, on pensions, and all of these things, we weren't in a good shape before COVID. So let's make sure we come out of this stronger and better able to tackle all of the issues that are of importance to people. I, I suppose we, we'll go through some of the measures um, that, that are in there. And I, I mean, I've listed some of them already, but I suppose the first and obvious question, right, you're going to borrow some money, but it can't all come from borrowing and borrowing has to be paid back at some point. So where is this magic money tree that all this is going to be paid for with? Because you can borrow it, but we have to pay it back. Sure. And, and it's not a magic money tree. So <clears throat> the first thing is to put it in perspective, the, the scale of the deficit uh, uh, that we would be running next year, if you were to follow Sinn Féin's investment plan, will be broadly in line, for example, with what France is projecting, which is a deficit of about 7%. 
So this isn't isn't a, a crazy excessive stuff. This is actually very prudent given the, the constraints that we're in. And you can see from the alternative budget there <clears throat> that while there's additional borrowing, there's also additional revenue raising, which of course we include every year to make our, our tax system more progressive. But I have to, I mean, really emphasize <clears throat> We're talking about interest rates that are either in the 0.0 or negative interest rates. So yes, you pay it back. But the reason why you invest now is you invest to create jobs. So for example, we have a very ambitious housing program, an additional 1.5 billion euros to invest in public housing. That doesn't just create the housing that working families need, therefore reducing their overheads and putting less pressure on businesses for increased wage claims. It puts lots of people into work. Lots of people who would otherwise uh, be on social welfare or the PUP or, or, or whatever else, they're working, they're paying taxes. So this is a counter-cyclical strategy. It's invest to get ourselves, not just through COVID, but out the other side with a more robust economy, uh, 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 more people in employment, more people paying tax. Again, the investments have to be right. So you can't use borrowing for current expenditure. You have to invest in critical public infrastructure, public transport and housing are, are two of the key ones for us. But you also have to give the temporary income supports that people need because Today, right across the country, north and south, uh, we have hundreds of thousands of people who are looking at the increased levels of virus uh, spread and who are wondering, is my business going to close? Am I going to be temporarily laid off? What level of income will I have? So borrowing for capital infrastructure uh, 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 to stimulate oh, sorry, the economy. Just Needs. Oh, there is. You are kind of raising a lot of taxes as well, though, from from the doctrine I can see. Um, I think you're talking about a total of two point two billion in. Um, not new taxes as such, but do, doing away with a lot of old taxes. Um, one, one of the more notable, noticeable ones is uh, what you're calling, is this a new thing, a solidarity tax, which will be 3% on all incomes above €140,000, and you suggest that that will raise €152 million. Euro. Um, like obviously, that's on top of all the other uh, tax revenues that someone will pay. Uh, can you talk us through that and, and, and what you mean possibly by solidarity? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the first thing is, is if you look at, again, I think it's on page 33 of, of the, the, the budget submission, you see all of the taxes we're looking to raise, but also some of the taxes we're looking to reduce to make the tax system more equitable. I think the net increase between the two is about 1.4 billion. One of the really interesting things is if you look at the media coverage of, of what's happened with the tax tape recently, in fact, tax revenues have appeared to be more buoyant than people thought. The reason why is because the impact of COVID is disproportionately being borne in terms of income loss on low and middle income earners uh, and wealthier uh, uh, income earners are far less and in many cases not negatively affected at all. So in that kind of a context, it's not unreasonable to ask for very, very modest amounts from people who earn very, very high salaries. And you talk about three cents on the euro uh, over uh, 140,000. Uh, and that's to generate some of the, the additional revenue that's needed because uh, uh, you cannot borrow all of this. Uh, and we've always argued that our tax take uh, as a percentage of GDP is way below the EU average. Again, we're not looking to go above the EU average, but there are some additional taxes that can be raised there that are sensible, uh, that are prudent, and give us the revenue to invest in the critical infrastructure that we need. Two, two, two other ones I'll just briefly just uh, ask you about is to, and these are quite sizable amounts of revenue being raised by them, is to remove tax credits on a tapered basis on incomes over 100 grand. So you just tell us what, what type of tax credits you're talking about there. And the other one is, and I think so. it's when I see some of these things in budget submissions, you always kind of wonder, how are you really striking that money? Or how are you, is, is this is a little bit uh, imagined when you talk about introducing an 80% cap on capital allowances claimed against intangible assets, on onshore, onshored, on shore, maybe it's onshore by multinationals, which is going to come to seven hundred and twenty million. So, if you could just talk us through both of those briefly, and 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 both of these costings are are are, are from the department. Uh, mm. So, some years ago, uh, uh, we shifted a policy instead of having a third band of income tax on on high earners. Uh, what we decided to do was to reduce the tax credits instead. <coughs> Uh, it's a simpler way of doing the same thing. But what you're saying is, you know, high income earners uh, uh, should be paying a, a little bit less. But how we do it is we reduce their tax credits on income earned over 100,000. That, that's been something we've been proposing for uh, two or three years from memory. The intangible assets, <clears throat> it's unlikely that this would be a recurring expenditure. Uh, uh, but this is essentially, I suppose, uh, to tax the intellectual property of multinationals uh, 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 because currently it's not being taxed at all. And one of the really frustrating things for small and medium-sized employers uh, uh, who are actually after the state 
the biggest employer uh, of people is that they have to pay the full 12.5% corporation tax and they pay it and they pay it uh, uh, without question. Whereas we have this history of allowing special deals for very large companies. Now, people often say with the multinationals, OBJ can't be too hard on them because you'd lose the jobs they create, like Apple and Cork. But in fact, Apple's manufacturing in Cork pays 12.5%, no problem, and we don't want to change that. But there are, are other arms of these multinationals which locate their intellectual property in Ireland. There are no jobs created in Ireland from that, and they do it for tax purposes. And therefore, our view is, is that's legal tax avoidance and it should be taxed. Yeah. In this instance, my understanding is, although Pierce Doherty is much more adverse uh, than, than, than uh, I am in the detail of this, is that this wouldn't be a recurring expenditure. You might get a little bit less the following year, the year after. But okay. this is money, again, that could be used to provide the ICU beds, the affordable housing, the reductions in the cost of childcare. <clears throat> and when I speak it's to not fair to say that just on the corporation tax side of things, that in recent years that we have actually clamped down on on corporations, you, you, you just have to look at the figures that are announced every every quarter. That it, it's huge amounts of revenue that we're getting from corporation corporation tax. But do, do you risk by by pushing them too far? Then then you, you are pushing them into the, into the arms of another state who who would be happy to take your no, business because, because we're not raising corporation tax. And and mm-hmm. when a, a a company decides to locate in a jurisdiction, they don't just look at the tax regime. They look at the education level. They look at the skills level. They look at the regulatory regime. And Ireland offers a very attractive package uh, to those uh, uh, direct investors, which is why they're here. What we're saying is, if there's a rate of tax that has to be applied by business, then all businesses should pay it. It should be paid fairly and equally uh, by uh, all. Uh, And I have to say, I don't think anybody really objects to that in principle. Um, And crucially, uh, when I talk to employers, particularly the employers, let's say in Dublin City Centre, the retail employers, they were telling us before COVID, their biggest challenge at the moment was rising wage claims from workers because of the rising cost of living healthcare, housing, and childcare. So if we want to reduce those costs of living uh, and ensure that the employers continue to work in the way they were, there is going to be additional revenue. You can't borrow all of this. Some of it has to be taxation. But again, we're not even close to the European average on tax as a percentage of GDP. These are actually, in a, in a mainstream European context, very modest proposals, and they will generate the revenue to ensure we can buy, buy people with proper healthcare, proper housing, proper childcare, and proper sure. income during well, the COVID. We compete with those, those other European countries in an entirely different way. We're, it's, this isn't France versus Germany, this is Ireland versus France and Germany, where we're off in the Atlantic Ocean trying to be a, a hub for international business. What to take your point. But, but can, I make, can I make this point? Because people often forget it. After the state, the second largest employer uh, 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 on the island, after government, is small and medium sized businesses. And what small and medium-sized businesses will tell you, go and talk to them, and I'm sure you do regularly, is that they feel that there's, there's, there's a, a two-tier system here, that all of the attention is on, on small numbers of foreign direct investors who do create jobs and generate significant tax revenue. But ultimately, if we're going to grow the economy, we have to also support those small and medium-sized employers. And that also means bringing down the cost of living of their employees in ways that are fair and sustainable. And you're right, we're not the same as France or Germany. But Irish people need the same number of ICU beds per, per thousand of the population as France or Germany do now because we're all being affected by the virus in the same way. We have half the number of ICU beds that are required, according to an independent study published 10 years ago. Uh, we have less ICU beds now than we had a year and a half ago. And again, if we're going to provide the extra 100 ICU beds that we proposed here, or the 8,000 affordable homes to rent or buy, or the 21% reduction in the cost of childcare and increase the wages for people working in the childcare sector, we need a sustainable revenue base to do that. And we think our proposition does all of those things. Two quick ones, on, and then I want to move on to, to some of the actual spending that you're going to do. But just on the income side of things, I, I don't see any changes in there in terms of income tax, apart from that, what we talked about there, the solidarity tax on, on people earning €140,000. You're not changing the bans or the USC or anything like that. No, no. The, the only thing, obviously, is the change of the tax credits for those are over, earning over 100000 And again, I suppose, obviously, we set out uh, an alternative fiscal plan in the run-up to the general election, uh, and there were a variety of other things, and, and a, a, a reduction in USC for certain categories of earners was there, were there. We don't believe that's prudent now in the context of COVID-19, and therefore, that's the reason why there have been those changes. Okay, that's fine. But also, uh, and, when, and I, you- when, I, when I talk to working people, the one thing they say to me is, 
if we can reduce their cost of living on health, housing and childcare, that is better for them. And that's why that's, I suppose, our priority in the current context. And then just finally, and this is kind of a yes or no, but the, the, the government have uh, more or less said that they're going to draw down that $1.5 billion that went into the rainy day fund. But do we ever imagine that we'd be uh, spending it already? But are Sinn Féin proposing that that would be part of your money as well for 2021, that the rainy day fund would be raided? Yeah, well, keep in mind, it started raining heavily before COVID-19. We're now in the middle of, of a storm. Uh, so this is precisely the time when that money should have been spent. But we argue that money should have been spent before anyway to tackle those cost of living crises. Because for people living in the private rental sector or people paying excessive prices for childcare, it was raining well before COVID-19 got here. Uh, uh, now the place is flooding. So prudency would say now the time is to invest that money sensibly. OK, on COVID then, let's go through some of the the measures that you're there. And I suppose one that has been well debated, but but it's there in black and white now in your budget um, document, is the, the pandemic unemployment payment. You want to bring that back up to €350. Euro. You want to extend it beyond April, whereas, which is the end date currently. And you're putting a cost on that of $1.5 billion. That seems very conservative. Uh, well, that's the, 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 the figures that we have back on the basis of, of, of projected claims uh, and the cost of those claims. From but, what, but what is that based on, Owen? I mean, we're, we're here debating level three versus four versus five. And at each level, I mean, you had Leo Varadkar saying uh, earlier in the week that it would be 400,000 people out of work on top of what's already out of work if we went to level five. So if we ended up in an extended level five, like how do you even figure out what the, the budget necessary is? Oh, you commit to 350, I, I, you could end up paying any amount. If we end up in level sure, five till, till March or April yeah. or May. Yeah, and, and I think I said at the start that this is a very unusual period of time for budget because <clears throat> while it's always difficult to project uh, uh, demand-led schemes like social welfare payments, now it's virtually impossible because we don't know what's going to happen with the, with the uh, uh, pandemic and we don't know what's going to happen with restrictions. I suppose what, what we have to try and do, however, is say where restrictions are there how do we ensure that people are able to survive uh, financially? Uh, and therefore, our view, and it has been our view from the very start, it was always wrong to cut the pandemic unemployment payment. We have made, on the basis of the figures and data that's been given to us by the Department of Social Protection, the Department of Finance, our uh, uh, best estimate in terms of what that is going to cost. <clears throat> Can any of us tell us what level of restriction we're going to be in this time next year? Are we going to have a vaccine? Where is the virus going to be at? No, but you have to try and project. What I would say is this. We have huge numbers of families out there that have mortgages, that have college fees, that have childcare fees, uh, and they are now getting substantially less than they were before they were laid off. Uh, these aren't unemployed people. These are people temporarily laid off because of COVID-19. Uh, and therefore, if they're to pay their mortgages, if they're to pay their childcare, if they're to have a basic standard of living, then the state has to say, given the fact that it's the state's public health restrictions on the basis of medical advice that has led those people to be laid off, we're going to continue to support them. Likewise, with the wage, uh, with the uh, employment uh, subsidy scheme, we also need to keep those businesses in, 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 in operation. Uh, and again, if public health advice says higher levels of restrictions are required, and if that's the direction we go in, we have to provide the adequate supports. Does it cost money? Absolutely, yes, it does. But actually, this is precisely the kind of current expenditure which you should borrow from, because everybody's expectation is at some point that ends whether it's through a vaccine or substantially getting the virus under control and you reopen the economy. So these are temporary areas of expenditure, which are absolutely but right. Would you no, go back no. to the situation where, where it was kind of everybody was getting it? And look, we all heard the anecdotal stories and, and I think we probably all know people in our own lives who were getting less than €350 euro and suddenly were like, cha-ching, this is great. It's €350 euro and I don't even have to go to work. And our proposal deals with that because anybody who was earning uh, uh, under €200 euros uh, previously only gets a pandemic unemployment uh, payment of 203 and those earning more previously get 350 so we've always looked for you're uh, keeping the tapered measure the tapered amounts you're going to keep those yeah look, when, when COVID-19 was first introduced um, the, the priority was to get the payment out to as many people as possible so look people who were working part-time get 100 euros a week ended up getting 350 right now yeah. the logic from government was let's just get it out there but clearly uh, if you're trying to protect the incomes of households then if somebody was earning less than 200 euros a week, they shouldn't be getting 350. They should be getting 200 euros. And for those people whose incomes were above that, they should be getting the 350. So we, we've mm. two tiers. But be very, very clear. I, I'm talking to taxi drivers, for example, who can't get back to work because there aren't enough jobs. They've been assessed on income mm. from 2018, even though they were earning 500 euros a week in January, February, and early March this year. And they're on 200 euros. How do you pay a mortgage and childcare for your 
partner who's out working and your kids in school with all those costs. This is about supporting those families for whatever period of time COVID-19 forces them out of work. The responsible thing for government to do is to support those families and the employers through the wage subsidy schemes now. Sure. But I look, I, I take it all your figures are legit and it's all done by the Department of Finance and every I is dotted, every T is crossed. But when I look at this and I'm seeing your social welfare package here, and it includes increasing all working age social welfare payments, presumably job seekers, et cetera, by five euros a week. It also includes increasing pensions by three euro a week. It, it just kind of, it gives, it gives a little, it feeds into possibly the idea of, you know, the Sinn Féin fantasy economics that, that, that some people would say. Because I think even the public at large accept that there just isn't the money there to be doing these type of things. Like, it, there isn't even a call for it this year. Willie O'D hasn't called for the pension to be increased and you guys are increasing the pension. Look, I've, I've, I've never taken economic or policy advice from any member of Fianna Fáil and certainly not Willie really, uh, O'D. <laughs> Two things I would say. First of all, uh, the cost of living is increasing for everybody. So if you don't increase social welfare payments at some level, that actually means it's a net cut because the value of the money that they're getting will purchase less out in the, uh, out in the local economy because of the, the, the rising cost of living. But the second thing is this. Every single euro of those social welfare payment increases gets spent locally, and it has an additional stimulus effect. And again, if you look at what's happening in our towns, in our cities, in our villages, small businesses are desperate for customers to spend. So therefore, it has a double benefit. It maintains the income adequacy of very, very low-income families, including families that are in part-time work and getting family income supplement and pensioners, etc. But it also stimulates demand in the local economy, and that keeps people in jobs. So these are modest, sensible, counter-cyclical measures and what we don't want is people falling into ever greater levels of poverty uh, because we weren't willing to provide modest increases in social welfare payments, which is what these are. Can I ask you, Owen, about the stay and spend scheme? Because obviously uh, it's something I think that most people, I, I know Sinn Féin had a different version of it and they do again uh, from what the government brought in. Um, I think most people welcome the scheme, thought that's a nice few quid I can make, albeit I'll have to wait for it in, in, in the revenue tax returns. You want to get rid of that and replace it now with a 200 euro hospitality voucher for every adult and a 100 euro uh, for every child. So, for example, if I am a family of uh, two parents and three kids, I am getting 700 euro off the state to go and spend when, unfortunately, I can't leave my county and there's no restaurants open and <laughs> all the rest of it. I mean, it's a lot of money to, to hand out to people. Yeah. But keep in mind, it's about keeping people in employment uh, and other jurisdictions have done similar things. And like in some senses, the difference between us and the government isn't that there shouldn't be a scheme. We want a scheme that works quickly and injects the money into the local economy. If government had taken our advice and introduced our scheme back when we proposed it, which was back during the summer when people could move around, that would have given a significant income boost to many, many of those local employers. And it would have kept uh, people in jobs who are now temporarily, temporarily laid off and claiming social welfare. The more people we can keep in jobs, the more businesses remain sustainable, the less people ultimately fall into long-term social welfare uh, use. And we know in the hospitality sector, uh, in the uh, uh, restaurant uh, uh, sector, we have far too many people on, on, on low wages. The more of those that slip into social welfare, the harder it is to get them back out and back into jobs because it takes longer to create a new business. So this is about supporting employers and support, supporting jobs. W would it not be open, though, to, to kind of widespread? No, I don't know, fraud isn't probably the word, but you can imagine someone has 700 euro in vouchers and they, they know the local publican and they go down, give me 650 and I'll give you my 700 euro in vouchers. Uh, uh, so long as the scheme is designed right and managed right, uh, uh, I, I don't see that as a huge problem. But, but what are any, the control mechanisms like? Clearly, clearly, any system that you introduce, whether it's any payment, so the wage subsidy scheme, the pandemic unemployment, uh, a tourism voucher, you always have to guard against the potential uh, for people breaking the rules of the scheme. Uh, but it, it's very different when revenue were involved or the Department of Social Protection versus a voucher. Un unfortunately, it's not. And, and at an early stage, TDs from across the house we're hearing stories of small numbers of employers that were fraudulently operating the scheme or, or doing things like getting the, the wage subsidy scheme, uh, uh, giving their workers 70% of their wages, but demanding if they wanted to keep their job to work 100% of the hours, completely against the spirit of the scheme. So you have to manage those things always. But look, the vast majority of people want to do the right thing. The vast majority of people will do the right thing. And for that very small number who don't, you need to have adequate oversight and enforcement measures to protect against it. Uh, and that's the way any of these schemes work, 
whether it's on the, the supply side or the demand side. Um, finally, then on the COVID and the health side of things, and because uh, I know you're keen to talk about housing as well, but we would deliver 1,100 hospital beds, 100 ICU beds, and recruit 2,500 additional nurses and doctors. From where? Well, interestingly, when the government made Ireland's call, 75,000 people signed up to it. Many, many people returned home to try and sign up to participate in that public health effort. And in fact, if you look at nursing undergraduates that are coming out of UCD every year, their problem is they can't get adequate employment in Ireland, which is why we're exporting some of the best trained nurses in Europe to Scotland, to Britain and elsewhere. So we've no doubt if you provide the places, people will come and take up that employment. However, and this does link to issues of housing, health and childcare, they can only do that if we also reduce the cost of living and make it attractive for them to stay in Ireland, live and work in Ireland. I just, just on it, I take those points, but one thing I think that emerged with the Ireland's call thing as well, while there was a lot of people whose heart were, and were in the right place and, and were trying to put forward, only a few, when the filter was put on them and uh, they went through the various HR processes that are necessary, very few were able to, to take up positions or were kind of deemed and qualified fact- to... to, to that, that wasn't the primary problem. I mean, I, I, I dealt with a significant number of highly qualified and experienced nurses, Irish nurses that were working in the British NHS, that came home, signed up to Ireland's call, and were left waiting for weeks and weeks and weeks, and only ended up working in hospitals because they went and picked up the phone uh, to a clinical director in a hospital where they might have done their work experience years before, and they got direct access in. So, in fact, there were lots of bureaucratic problems in Ireland's call. Of course, not all of the 75,000 people uh, uh, would have had the skills that were required. But there were lots and lots of people who had those skills and those skills weren't availed of. But the central point is still the same. We need more ICU beds. We need more hospital beds. That means we need more medical staff. The only way you get those medical staff is you open up the opportunities, you open up the recruitment pathways. And alongside that, you make it attractive and comfortable for them to come back to work and live or not to emigrate uh, to work in health systems elsewhere in the world. Because we subsidize the, the nursing programs education in UCD to a huge extent. It is a wonderful program. I've spoken on a number of occasions to the nurses about housing policy and homelessness, would you believe? And yet then we allow them to go off uh, to work in in Scotland and and England because they can get decent jobs there and better quality of life. We need to provide that here. Okay, we'll move on to housing then. Deliver 12,000 real social homes. Not sure why you have to put the word real in there. Maybe you can explain. 4,000 affordable rental homes and 4,000 affordable purchase homes at a cost of 1.5 billion the reason why we use the word real is because that means properties that are owned by local authorities and approved housing bodies Uh, we've had a long-standing dispute both with the previous government and with this where they also include a variety of privately owned lease properties and they claim they're social housing they're not they're subsidized private rental tenancies of two four uh, years or, or longer so for us a social home is one that isn't a privately owned property subsidized through an income support it is owned by a local authority approved housing body. The so how, many, how many of them are you going to build and how many are you going to buy? Sure. 12,000 is a big number in a market that doesn't have a huge supply in it. So, first of all, the government has a commitment next year to deliver 10,000 real social homes. Mm. We want to add 2,000 onto that. Uh, and uh, uh, some of that will be built, but some of it will also be, be acquired through what they call turnkey developments. That's where a private develop, developer is on site and sells the, the site uh, uh, in total. The reason why we need to start doing that, in fact, is because many private developers are telling us that they're going to have to slow down their output over the next year to two years, either because of a drop in mortgage approvals or a nervousness on funders. Now, we want to make sure that those sites keep developing, that the workers on those sites keep working and paying tax and getting income. And therefore, next year particularly, but also early into the year after, there will be, I think, increased opportunities for the state to acquire turnkey developments at really good value for money. The only difference is, is in Sinn Féin's approach, we wouldn't use those exclusively for social housing. We would use a large volume of those to deliver good quality, affordable uh, rental and purchase units for working families. And the irony, irony would be, if a local authority goes in tomorrow to Adamstown and acquires a turnkey development of 100 units, and it decides 30% will be social, 70% will be affordable with a mixture of sale and, and, and rent, it will be able to sell those units on cheaper to a first-time buyer then if that first time buyer was actually buying that unit off the original developer because there's no profit margins and because they would have bought them at a discount, etc. So what we want to do is take advantage, I suppose, of one of the co- negative consequences of COVID, uh, a slowdown in private sector supply to fill that gap. It's something that the SRI called for in a very important report only two weeks ago. But there also has to be more building. And one of the things that has to stop 
is this business of using public housing and allowing 50% of, of the houses on that public land to be sold at unaffordable market prices. Oscar Trainer uh, in North Dublin City at the moment, uh, Dublin City Council has a plan on public land to build a development with about 50% of the houses at unaffordable market prices. We wouldn't allow that and we'd say, let's have 30% social, 30% affordable rental for working families uh, who don't need a subsidy and 30% genuinely affordable sales. So that's rents, 700 to 900 euros for a standard apartment and purchase prices for a new home of 230,000 or less, depending on the size. So there are opportunities. Would it be a, a, a huge push? Yes. But most housing experts, I mean, the Society of Chartered Surveyors produced a report and then a really good article in the Irish Times the week before last, making exactly the same cases we've been making for a period of time. I'm not saying this would be easy, but unless we are ambitious and unless we back up our, our rhetorical call for action on housing with real investment to provide working families with homes they can afford to rent or buy, it's never going to happen. So we think it's an ambitious programme. Uh, but we also think it's the kind of program that's required, particularly because of COVID. It, it's, it's, I'm, I'm going to ask you how you think Dara O'Brien is doing as housing minister, because it, it strikes me that when he was on the opposition benches, he would talk an awful lot like you're talking now. And I, I, it's not quite as easy when you have to get in there. But the one thing I'd say is Dara O'Brien never published a detailed or costed affordable housing plan when he was in opposition. Uh, uh, not only did I do it when I was in opposition, but we provided a, a, a revised plan in draft form in May of this year uh, and a fully costed plan to explain how we could deliver those 8,000 units next year uh, just six weeks ago. <clears throat> and when I say fully costed, it's not just costed by the Department of, of Finance and Housing, but also I spent a lot of time engaging with local authorities, with approved housing bodies and other professionals. So I suppose we're not just calling for stuff in a in a a rhetorical way, we're providing detailed costed plans at every stage. Now, let's be very clear, right? There, there is no silver bullet. Nobody can just walk in and fix this housing uh, uh, problem overnight. This is going to take five to 10 years to get right. But here's the crucial thing. This year, the government will invest about 1.2, 1.3 billion in public housing, primarily social. Uh, uh, but the number of families that will come on the local authority housing waiting list this year will be greater than the number of properties provided. Since Rebuilding Ireland was published, not a single affordable home to rent or buy has been delivered by any government scheme, any centrally funded government scheme. The cost rental pilot to provide affordable rental for working families that was promised in 2016 is only now under construction and it will only be tenanted next year and it's only 50 units. So what we need from government is not empty promises, but coherent plans and targets to say, how many social homes do we need next year? Minimum 12,000. How many affordable homes do we need next year publicly delivered? minimum 8,000 with a split between a rental and purchase. And then we need to do that every year for about a decade because the dysfunctional housing system we have, while exacerbated by Owen Murphy and, and Simon Coveney, has been 30 years in the making. And you can make tangible improvements year one, two, and three, but it's going to take a lot longer to fix problems that are three decades old. Okay, I, I, I'm going to give you the uh, the hypothetical one to, to finish up, but Pascal Donoghue and Michael McGrath take this document, 33 pages, they have a, a good read of it, they go, yeah, there's a bit of everything in here for everyone, and sure, if we could do that, we'd be re-elected tomorrow, no hassle. Um, but they say, oh, you're, you're practical at the back of it. Give us two things that if we do it, you'll praise us, and we'll leave it at that, because you can just have two things out of your list. What are they? Well, the first thing, if, if the government do anything positive, I praise them. And in fairness, if you look at my track record with Owen Murphy and, uh, and uh, Simon Covey, the very few good things they did, I welcomed it. And in fact, we were... God, I'd have to do a troll of the archives for that praise. No, no. So, 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 for example, I passed a piece of legislation to give students uh, 4% uh, rental protections in rent pressure zones. Owen Murphy approached myself and Darrell Bryan. He said, look, let's work together. I'll introduce government legislation, which will be more rigorously produced because it has the advice of the Attorney General, and we'll get this done. We said, fine, no problem. Owen Murphy was true to his word. He introduced his legislation. I withdrew mine uh, and ourselves, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, as well as the rest of the opposition, passed it, and students have better protections today, and I congratulated them on them. So, so that was a, a very rare example. But to, to answer your question, for me, there are three things the government needs to prioritize. I, I only gave you two. I know. You see, this uh, classic Sinn Féin. Classic Sinn Féin. I give you two things and you want and, three. I'm going to take three, but three is a pretty good one, right? We need the income supports for workers now, uh, and we need additional investment in health and housing. Those are the three areas. Lots of other areas are in there as well, but they're the three critical things that we have to get right, and we have to get right now. If you can borrow at negative interest rates, 
Uh, you're being paid to borrow, in a se- essentially, uh, by uh, the markets. Now is the time to support workers and businesses through COVID, but critically invest in the health and housing infrastructure. So when we get out the other side of this, we have a much more robust uh, 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 economy. People's cost of living are lower, and people aren't spending €2,000 a month on rent, paying €400,000 for a basic home, or having to wait two or three years for vital surgery in our hospitals. Now is the time to invest while supporting workers through the impact of COVID-19. So, so if Pascal Donoghue came to you and said, look, I'm going to put the pup back up to 350 going to get those 1,100 hospital beds and the ICU beds, and uh, we're going to take on your housing, your 12,000 social housing and your 8,000 affordable, um, but we're not doing the Susie Grant cut, we're not doing the property tax cut, uh, we're not doing the Suckler Calf Fund, uh, we're not doing the 800 Guardi, you'd say, well, look, it's not a bad, a bad show for budget day. But what I would say is it's better than what I think they're going to do, but it's not as good as it could have been. And look, go back to what I said at the start. These are choices. And I suppose what we're saying is, is that there are, is an opportunity here to ensure that we do the right thing. The big challenge here is not that we do too much. The big challenge is government doesn't do enough. And you know, somebody said to me the other day, 10 years ago, government borrowed 25 billion euros to bail out uh, Anglo-Irish Bank, a single bank. Right? What we're actually saying is now it's the time to borrow, to invest, to stabilise people's incomes now and to ensure they have adequate childcare, healthcare and housing into the future. But they are doing that though, Owen, I think, is that's fair to say. They are doing mm-hmm. that at the moment. They are doing that at the moment. Uh, borrowing doing huge that? amounts. The government. Uh, they're, not, they're, cer- they're certainly not uh, uh, investing enough to tackle the kinds of issues that we're, we're talking about. And look, you guys live in the real world. You can see the price of rents out of Dublin. You can see the price uh, of houses. You can see the waiting lists in hospitals. So now is the time to do this. Some of the things the government have done, for example, they were moving in the right direction. Pierce Doherty said very clearly when the wage subsidy scheme was introduced, that was a good idea. Could they have done it better? Yes, they could. And we're outlining how they can do that now. But the crucial thing is now is not the time to be cautious. Now is the time to be ambitious and invest in supporting families and in businesses now and invest in strengthening the economy, in particular health, housing and childcare into the future. Okay, well, we look forward to your uh, your praise of uh, the budget next Tuesday. I suspect not, but um, we shall see how it plays out when when Pascal Donoghue and Michael McGrath have their their first double act um, on Tuesday. And we hope to have Pascal Donoghue on the floating voter next week for what I suspect will be a slightly different conversation, um, Owen, when we see what, what actually transpires from from the government's thinking. But that is our lot for today. This was the floating voter in a association with EY. My thanks to Philip Ryan, as always, and to Sinn Féin's owner of Rin for talking us through what the opposition would do if they had control of the purse strings. You've been listening to a Floating Voter Budget Special in association with EY Ireland. <laughs>